Comparison is a disease. It robs people of identity and joy, and I think most of us experience this desire to fit in because rejection is painful. I used to pretend to be whatever I needed to be so that people wouldn't think less of me. I spent years trying to accommodate some phony facade, and I lost track of who I really was. When we spin our wheels trying to be someone else, it's usually because we haven't let God tell us who we really are. Tonight, contestant number 17, Tasha Lynn Lake, will sing the energetic song, Shout to the Lord, by Darlene Jett. <laughs> My mom says that I came out of the womb singing. I can't remember a time when I wasn't singing. I remember being in church choirs and school choirs on worship teams, and I just really loved music. When I was growing up, I had a church leader say some things about me that weren't true. I was 16, young, impressionable. I just wanted to be accepted and loved by my church family and my church leaders. But this person had told, you know, the whole church that I wasn't a virgin, that I was trying to seduce people in the church, that I had a Jezebel spirit, that I was going to split the church. I mean, it was bad. You know, I found out later that she was unwell mentally, and this was essentially her battle and not mine. And while I knew nothing of what she was saying was true, I also thought, what am I doing wrong that she could think those things? Scripture says that the enemy is the father of lies. And I didn't know that I had taken a message and that the enemy had used that message year after year to keep me bound. I think in my season of church hurt, I really didn't want to have anything to do with music. Uh, because one of the areas that I was involved in heavily at church was music, and I was so hurt, I just walked away from it altogether. And when I changed my major from music to religion, I was really just looking for hope. I was searching for wholeness, just anything that could give me peace. I went to Buddhist meditation camps, synagogues, mosques, I studied mysticism and Jainism. I did it all. One of the things I realized about all those other religions is that there wasn't any power. No power to transform my life or heal my heart or heal my mind or heal my physical body. There was no power in those other paths. I was hurting and I wasn't getting help in the church. I didn't even know who to go to for help. I needed either hope or meditation or some mantra that I could convince myself that I was okay. At that point, I was catatonically depressed. I wasn't talking, I wasn't eating much. I was barely moving. I was at rock bottom. And at the end of that road of searching out all these other religions, I tried to take my life. I went into my college dorm room and I put a loaded gun to my head. And it didn't go off. I thought, God, maybe I'm still supposed to be here. Maybe you have a plan for my life. And I thought, I've got to force myself to go back to church. And so I forced myself to go for about a year. And one Sunday, the pastor said, if you want to touch from God, 
we're going to pray for you at the end of service. And I went up at the end of service and I left three hours later. It was like all of that numbness of not feeling anything, being so depressed and and feeling so alone. It was like it all came pouring out. I just literally let it all out. That day was an altar moment in my life, and it set me on a trajectory of wanting to serve, remembering my calling. And so I ended up going to seminary in California, and up until that point in seminary, I had not done any music still. And a lady came up to me and she said, I've been praying about who to ask to lead for this event, and your name keeps coming to mind. And so I knew that I was supposed to do it, and I did. And the glory of God fell in that room, and it was beautiful. And I ended up being a worship pastor at a church uh, there in California for four years. I met with my pastor, and I said, you know, I think I'm supposed to be doing some music other than worship. And he said, oh, Tasha, we've known that for years. And I started praying to that end. God, if you want me to do this, open the door. And I get a random call from Katy Perry's manager, who I didn't even know how they got my number. Would you be willing to audition to be a background singer? Could you be here in 20 minutes? And so I downloaded the song on my phone. I learned it in the car on the way, and I couldn't believe what was happening. I went from full-time ministry out of seminary at a church to singing with Katy Perry at Madison Square Garden in a matter of three days. God will use whatever we're willing to give Him. And with Him at the wheel, we are sure to have an incredible ride. in my mid-20s, late 20s, people would have looked at my life and thought, wow, she's got it together, or wow, that's going well. You know, I'd been to seminary, I was a worship pastor at a church, I had a great music career, and yet inside I was crumbling. There was a difference between what was in my head and what I was feeling in my heart. I was still carrying around the pain of my past and I needed to take a sabbatical. I decided to go to Colorado to an intensive counseling place to get some help. And when I did that, I realized that the lies in my heart started long before I thought. I thought, you know, broken relationships or church hurt or, you know, all the things I could list knowingly were the sources of my stuckness, my pain. When in reality, it was stuff, subtle things that had happened even when I was a child that I I took messages from. So the process that God and my therapist took me through to get me free was essentially allowing God to replace my lies with truth. I learned to some extent how much He loves me. And when you know how much God loves you, Whew, it changes everything. You feel free, you start smiling at strangers, you start helping random people. <laughs> it's like, it's such a beautiful thing, but you also stop comparing yourself to other people because you know how special God made you. When I look back at the pain that I've gone through in life, I realize that God hasn't wasted one drop of it. And I'm so thankful now because I think I'm in a healthier place now than I would have been. And I I have something to say now that has weight. I don't think I could have offered that to the world if I had not gone through the pain first, but then also his healing. I, I don't want to do it without him. I can't do it without him. And good songs or talent or charisma doesn't bring freedom. Those things don't bring healing. Those things don't break the yoke. The anointing of God breaks the yoke. And I can't do this without Him. None of us can. 
My songs are my life story. They are my testimonies, and God has used very personal things in my life to become pretty universal for the listener. But I think of that calling as a 13-year-old girl every single time I take the stage. Every single time I walk up those stairs, I feel the presence of God, His breath pushing me forward. I pray that when people hear my story or read about my story, that they can see the hand of God in all of the places, the mountaintops, the valleys, the crooked places, and that that in turn would cause them to see God's hand in their own story, and that He really is weaving a beautiful thread of love throughout our lives if we'll just take time to see it, and that He's working all things together for good for those who love Him.